Welcome to the panel on adult non-epileptic seizures ethics session. I'm Kurt LaFrance. I'm moderating this panel. And I'm the director of neuropsychiatry and behavioral neurology at Rhode Island Hospital and assistant professor of psychiatry and neurology at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, we have for you today experts in their respective fields to address chronic recurrent dilemmas that we deal with uh, in everyday practice, and, uh, but these have not been given adequate cross-disciplinary thoughtful attention that's needed uh, in order to solve some of these significant problems in the clinical care of patients with non-epileptic seizures and other somatoform disorders. In these talks, uh, we hope to uh, be both practical and bold as we chart uh, common territory, but new territory maybe, from an interdisciplinary perspective. I'll go ahead and introduce our three speakers. To open, Dr. Susan Stagno is the residency training director at uh, University Hospitals uh, Case Medical Center. And she has a long-standing interest in medical ethics and professionalism since completing her fellowship uh, in medical ethics at Cleveland Clinic Foundation. With appointments in the departments of psychiatry and bioethics in Case Western, and in concert with her interest in advocacy for patients with mental illness as they deal with hospital systems and care providers, she will address uh, the ethics of the unspoken agenda in medical education. A poignant example of the hidden curriculum is what I call the herd and the eye roll sign. What I mean by that is when the medical herd, the team, you know, you know what I'm talking about, that's everything from the medical student, intern, resident, fellow, attending, they're going room to room to see and examine all the patients. What gets communicated in the herd, um, in the body language, is as influential as the words that are shared on rounds. So when the patient with non-epileptic seizures is introduced by the attending or the fellow as, we've got another pseudo-seizure in room 201, and you get the eye roll and the sigh, uh, that's a telling and dismissive sign uh, that happens on rounds. And <clears throat> what gets communicated in the hierarchy of medical education to the medical students and the residents is, this is a faker who's wasting our time and our resources. Now let's blow through this one so we can get on to the real disease patients. Dr. Stagno will emphasize the importance of the narrative, as was emphasized earlier uh, in the lecture. and and provide the narrative, the importance in providing care for our patients with non-epileptic seizures and other somatoform disorders, along with the narrative of our trainees as they learn medicine uh, from colleagues and from mentors. Next, we'll have Dr. Brian Smith. He's the co-chair of the Department of Clinical Neurosciences and chief of the Division of Neurology at Spectrum Health in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He also serves as the Director of Clinical Neurosciences at Michigan State University College of Medicine. He is the Chair-Elect of the Epilepsy Foundation Professional Advisory Board, and uh, he's the Chair of the Epilepsy Foundation Board of Directors. He's also the Co-Chair of the American Epilepsy Society uh, Treatment Committee and Non-Epileptic <coughs> non Seizures Task Force. So his qualifications inform uh, the topic he'll be speaking on, on nosology and on coding for patients with seizures. Dr. Smith will discuss the persistence of the disparity that exists, even in the age of parity laws, where we may be paid if a seizure gets called one thing, ICD-9 code 780.39, seizures in OS, not otherwise specified, but we may be denied payment or have a reduced payment if we call a seizure something else, 300.11 conversion disorder seizure subtype. Dr. Aaron Klein will uh, be the final speaker, and he's assistant professor of neurology at Oregon Health and Sciences University and staff physician at the Portland VA. He is a former Greenwall Fellow in Bioethics and Health Policy 
jointly at Johns Hopkins University and uh, at the School of Public Health and at Georgetown University where he received his MD and his PhD. He co-edited The Story of Bioethics and his interests include neurology, philosophy, could you say neurophilosophy, the, okay. the emerging field. He will be addressing the role of the caregiver in patients with non-epileptic seizures. He'll present ideas on how family burden and family factors relate to the care and treatment of patients with non-epileptic seizures. How are, a fam how are families supposed to react when they hear providers in the emergency room? It's just a pseudo-seizure. Regarding care models, in medical school, we were taught about the doctor patient relationship, that dyad. And in caring for patients, however, it becomes apparent that that dyad is only a, one component of numerous elements of care when taking a systems based approach to management of patients' illnesses. The importance of family, friends, and community of faith are things that I emphasize. In cannot be underscored enough, and they're not emphasized sufficiently in medical training or practice. And this was discussed in Dr. Lisa Enderman's lecture last night on cross-cultural aspects of seizures. To bridge neurology, psychiatry, ethics, and philosophy, I thought of this session as an introduction to the epistemology of non-epileptic seizures. How do we know what we know about non-epileptic seizures? What our patients have? How do we treat non-epileptic seizures, conceptualization? For context, uh, for this session, our practice is knowingly or unknowingly informed by medical cultures, cultures, mores, and societal ethics. There are, as you know, different approaches uh, to ethics. One approach commonly used in patient-oriented care and research is normative ex ethics. Normative ethics frame our practice with questions such as, what should morality require? How should clinicians and researchers behave or not behave? What character traits should clinicians and researchers cultivate as virtues and avoid as vices? Furthermore, to inform our research using the Belmont principles uh, of respect for persons, beneficence, and justice, these research ethics can provide us with a structure for analysis and decision making they can help to remind us to protect our patients and our subjects, and they provide a workable definition of risks and benefits, what we call counting the costs, and balancing risks and benefits for the individual and society. So to wrap up the introduction, the common theme that you'll hear through these talks is the implicit language that we speak or convey with our actions to our patients and to their family members and to our pupils and colleagues. The relationship with our patient and their family is paramount to providing good clinical care. When we use pejorative language, such as pseudo-seizures, or when we take out our biases on our patients and their families, we create barriers to treatment. And building rapport and trust between the clinician and the patient and family is at the essence of that relationship. Interestingly, we found that effective non-epileptic seizure treatment and symptom resolution involves making the implicit explicit. As we listen today and as we dialogue and hopefully apply this in the future, perhaps this is an opportunity for us to examine ourselves and our practices and to heed the words, physician heal thyself. Perhaps these lectures will open avenues to provide better care as clinicians, researchers, thinkers, thought leaders, educators, mentors, policy makers, ethicists, and advocates for those whom we serve. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction, and thank you all for being here, and uh, special thanks to Dr. Ford for inviting me uh, for this presentation. I'm not sure I know how to advance the slides. Mouse, left. Ah. Very good, thank you. So you've heard a little bit about the hidden curriculum, and I'm going to expand a bit on this uh, by using the context of narrative, which I think I'm, I'm hoping will, you'll see the thread with um, Dr. Hutzfett's presentation. So I th there are many ethical concerns, I think, that uh, are, are inherent in the care of patients who have non-epileptic seizures. The, the 
uh, words that I would prefer to use. Some are listed here, and I would highlight a couple of things that are kind of particular areas of, uh, I guess, irritation, if you will, for me, and that is the idea that uh, it, it is eth ethically justified to trick patients or use, provoke uh, or induce the psychogenic seizure in order to make a diagnosis because we've got to get the right diagnosis to get the right treatment, and so that's ethically justified. The other thing that uh, has always been a little mysterious to me is that neurologists will make the diagnosis of conversion disorder or psychogenic seizures without a psychiatric database or history. Hmm. Uh, as we look toward DSM-5, perhaps that is going to be legitimized, which is a little troublesome to me. Um, the other issues that we've heard some about, uh, neurologists struggle with the idea of truth-telling or being able to convey what, what they think is going on when a patient is found not to have real or genuine or epileptic seizures. And the language, is, as Dr. LaFrance referred to, the idea of hysterical seizures or pseudo-seizures, very pejorative. And, and as we all know, uh, some doctors use worse terms, croc, for example. Um, and then the concerns on how to manage patients. So, uh, but the thing that I would really like to focus on today, and one that's sort of become my most recent passion in life, is the idea of the hidden curriculum. So what is it and why does it matter? You heard a bit about the sighing, the eye rolling, right? Um, if we talk about uh, education anywhere, there's uh, the idea of a formal curriculum. What we say in a classroom or a formalized setting what we put together on a piece of paper as curriculum for this class or that. Then there's the informal curriculum, more kind of what's taught, say, at the bedside or that quick conference about, well, let's sit down and talk about, you know, why the sodium is abnormal in this illness. Then there's the hidden curriculum, the stuff that's not said, but what students, uh, residents, trainees learn by seeing what happens and what's accepted and how people treat the patients. Finally, there's the null curriculum, that is which is not taught. So what I'd like to do today is to examine the hidden curriculum through the lens of narrative ethics. So we'll take a look at the patient, the attending physician, and the trainees. Let's begin by considering the story of the patient. Let's call her Mary. Mary is 35 years old, and she has been experiencing spells in which she feels strange, becomes dizzy, and may or may not pass out and sometimes has jerking of her muscles or tremors. They began about seven years ago, and she's been seeing a variety of doctors ever since. Her family doctor thought she might have blood pressure problems, but that turned out not to be the case. So then he said, well, maybe they were seizures. This was frightening to Mary, but she worked with her doctor to try to find out what was wrong. He ordered an EEG, and it showed some kind of funny abnormal brain waves, but not really epileptiform brain waves. He started her on an anticonvulsant because he thought that would be a good idea to see how that works out. And Mary did feel better for a few months. But then the seizures came back, and she started to have a lot of side effects from her medication. Several medications were tried, but without any lasting benefit. Her doctor finally suggested that she see someone for help, and also referred her to a couple of general neurologists who saw her once each said they don't know what's wrong, but referred her to an epileptologist who put her in the hospital, and she underwent a video EEG evaluation. She had two seizures during her hospital stay, but they told her she didn't have epilepsy and that she should see a psychiatrist. She didn't go. She didn't know who to see, and she felt like they were calling her crazy. Some background information is that Mary's older brother had seizures when they were young, and a lot of attention was paid to him because of it. She felt that quite neglected and dismissed when she was young because her brother's illness took up a lot of the family energy, and they paid a lot of attention in trying to get his seizures under control, visiting him in the hospital, etc. And Mary's mother really didn't have a lot of time and energy left for Mary. As her brother got into adolescence, however, he sort of outgrew the seizures. They went away, but the family still seemed to revolve around the brother. And Mary says he could do no wrong. It was when he was 16 and Mary was 13 that he began sexually abusing her and also telling her that if she said anything to mom and dad, obviously they wouldn't believe her. And besides that, he would hurt her if she did. This went on until her brother left home three years later. 
Mary's had a lot of difficulty in relationships in her adulthood, and many of her relationships have been marked by abuse and boyfriends who have problems with alcohol and drugs. She has a hard time trusting people, including doctors. She often feels that they don't listen to her, that they don't believe her problems are real, that they dismiss her, and once she was told it was just nerves and she should get over it. She's gotten the message that she should be able to control these episodes on her own. She hates it when she has these spells. She's been told that she shouldn't drive a car. She's had some in public places and has been very embarrassed by this. She's lost jobs because of it, either because she couldn't come to work because she'd had a seizure or because she'd have a spell at work and they regarded this as a dangerous situation. She feels like these seizures have ruined her life and she can't find anyone who seems to be able to help her with them. So after a couple of years, she sees a neurologist again who puts her on an EEG monitoring unit. I would just mention that in a study by Nettleton and colleagues, they found that among 18 patients who were interviewed with medically unexplained symptoms, all at some point felt that their doctors, relatives, or acquaintances might see them as a fraud, a time waster, a hypochondriac, a malingerer, or a hysteric. When one patient was asked about the main problem she faces, she said, guilt. Being a fraud, a time waster, that whole thing is something I've manifested, and in some way, I'm perpetuating it. Another said, it's really a weird feeling because I feel like, you know, my symptoms are genuine, but everything comes back negative. But how can you discuss something that you feel, but which isn't there? So let's now turn to understanding the narrative of the attending physician. Let me introduce you to Mary's doctor. We'll call him Dr. Jones. He's a very hardworking and very dedicated physician. He wanted to go to medical school because he was fascinated by the sciences, he enjoyed solving problems, and he likes helping people. He was attracted to the field of neurology because of the way that specific types of nerve damage, strokes or lesions in the brain, had predictable patterns to them. They followed neurologic rules. She, he also became interested in treating patients with epilepsy. About half of his practice now is devoted to care of patients with epilepsy, and the other half is general neurology. He's been in practice for 10 years, he's married, he has two small children at home, and he likes working in an academic center, but he's really beginning to feel the pressures from all sides. His department chair wants him to publish more papers and to try to go up for promotion this year. He has to see a lot of patients to meet the productivity expectations, and although he likes having students and residents on service with him, he finds the requirements of teaching a bit onerous. And his wife is complaining that he spends way too much time at the hospital and he never sees the children and their relationship has suffered over the past couple of years. Dr. Jones finds patients like Mary troublesome and vexing. Her story is chaotic and complex. It, it takes way too long to get a coherent history from her and just when he thinks he has it, she changes her story a bit. He's pretty sure that she doesn't have real epilepsy anyway and feels that having her in the unit and trying to figure out what's going on with her is, as Dr. LaFrance said, one, a waste of time, and two, a waste of resources that could be used on patients with real disease. He dreads going into her room, and he tries to get in and out as quickly as he can. Mary had one of her spells that they all watched on a video with the students and residents, and he com commented, that looks really fake. And she made some odd movements during these spells that were atypical of her usual seizure, and the residents uh, laughed when they watched the video. The team has decided to keep her for another day or two because the seizure she had wasn't really typical of her usual seizure. Um, and so Dr. Jones is already now beginning to anticipate, I have to go in and have the talk with this patient and tell her she doesn't have epilepsy. And he fully expects her to be very rejecting and angry and difficult when that conversation occurs. In studies looking at the attitudes of various physicians, emergency room doctors, primary care doctors, and neurologists, some clear patterns emerge. Many doctors feel that patients with conversion disorder are producing their own symptoms, at least to some degree. They don't understand the notion of symptoms being unconscious and therefore can't explain the problem to their patients. And frankly, some don't believe that psychiatrists understand it either. They don't want to have to deal with these patients over the long term and feel that using some sort of trickery to prove the symptoms aren't real or physiological is okay. Doctors feel burdened by these patients. And here are some quotations from neurologists about con conversion disorder from a study by Kanan. 
There are certainly things that lead you to believe that this is psychogenic, but they're not totally reliable. So I tend to do things that are more confirmatory, which is really to trick the patient into doing things they don't believe they can. For example, if they're completely paralyzed and you can distract them into having a normal gait. Another quote, getting at how these patients make the neurologist feel. The person who just keeps coming back to you because they've got this symptom and that symptom, I put them in a different category because they're not, well, I suppose you'd have to word, use the word troublesome. It's all about how they make me feel. And with regard to the neurologist's responsibility to the patient's care, I guess my role, as I often say to them, is that I'm an electrician. I can tell you about the hard wiring, and I can try to tell you a little bit about this, what the soft wiring is. But you know, it takes a lot of discussion, which is not a luxury we have in the clinic. So I think you can begin to see how the two worlds of Mary, the patient, and Dr. Jones, the uh, physician in, in charge of her care now, are colliding a bit with each of their stories that they bring. So now enters the scenario of having trainees. First, we have the medical students, very early in their education. They're excited about getting involved in patient care and talking to real patients. They tend to be warm, caring, altruistic, and genuinely interested in patients. They don't yet have a lot of medical knowledge, and they're a little bit afraid of making mistakes or not abiding by the medical cultural rules of the medical wards. And so they look to their more senior students and the residents for direction. So they are easily influenced. As they progress in their medical education, as late third year or fourth year medical students, they often begin to get somewhat disillusioned by the world of medicine. You can't help everyone as much as they had hoped, and some people really don't seem to want to be helped. Patients do things that contribute to their illness, like drink alcohol, smoke cigarettes, and some patients, like Mary, are either faking it or don't have real disease anyway, and medicine doesn't seem to have much to offer. These students tend to feel more and more distance from their patient, and initially, the, that initially they found so fascinating and interesting and offer suffer, suffer some degree of burnout. As trainees advance into residency, some become frankly cynical. Doctors, like House, for example, who are really smart and seem to be able to quote the latest New England Journal of Medical article by memory or can perform amazing procedures that save people's lives become role models. But these superstar doctors may behave in ways that are arrogant and frankly disrespectful to patients in their care. But because of the, pay, the reputation, these best doctors are exalted in their institutions and they get away with behaviors that are unprofessional. With a clear message to students and residents that not only is it okay to behave that way, but these are the doctors who have the most status and get paid the most money. So this is the hidden curriculum. The messages that get conveyed about what behavior is okay, how doctors should interact with patients, who's really in charge. And all of this stuff that they heard in ethics class, just theory and notions that are put forth by people who aren't really doctors anyway. And residents and fellows, practicing physicians like Dr. Jones, all of whom had very good reasons to go into medicine, can find themselves quite demoralized and losing sight of the idea that patients' needs whether they be physical, emotional, psychological, or spiritual, are what doctors should care most about. So when a seizure isn't caused by epilepsy, there are many stories that come to bear on the patient's care and the interactions with the healthcare system, both with the patient and with one another, that profoundly affect the patient's experience and strongly influence the outcome of that clinical encounter. I would offer you this quote from a, an article uh, respect, uh, with respect to hidden curriculum. Attitudes influence behavior. Developing and maintaining proper attitudes by medical students can impact on the quality of care delivered to the patients as they assume the role of doctors. So what's your story? We each need to understand our own story, the background and biases we bring into the room, and we need to be able to carefully, thoughtfully listen to the story of the patients we serve. We need to be able to ask questions like, what do I need to know in order to understand the problem? What do you think ought to be done? What do you think is causing the problem? How has the problem impacted or changed your life? We need to change the culture of medicine and to be able to understand each patient in their own unique context. We need to be able to hear the patient's story. Because the mindful listening, the understanding and appreciation of the patient's story can shed light on how best to help that patient 
and also can begin the healing process. Thank you. Well, I think there's a, a lot of ways to approach that. Uh, you know, the first thing I think is that many people, many physicians sort of get this geared up idea that if I am dealing with a patient who has psychiatric disease or psychological issues or conversion, that it's going to take a long time. And so they're already very busy trying to avoid that. It may not. So I think it, it's just allowing uh, that the patient to be able to tell their story, to be able to uh, be willing to stick with it and actively listen to the story, and, and to be able to partner with the patient and, and talk about what might be helpful. Um, it, my, my concern is, is that there is such a preconceived notion that so many physicians have that they've already got the story built up in their head so that it doesn't really matter what the patient says because they already know what they regard as the truth. Um, so I think it's just allowing people to actually have the experience of hearing the patient's story, which I also would submit makes a huge difference in the satisfaction that physicians have about the work that they do when they can actually make an affective connection with the patients that they treat. Have you had experience different from children about their problems or dealing with a family that has a lot of control? I, I am uh, only an adult psychiatrist. I've not done wor work in the world of pediatrics, but I certainly ha you know, can, can speak to how this impacts families as well, which, of adult patients, which is, is very profound. session or be uh, involved right. in a session this afternoon on pediatric non-epileptic seizures and some of that can be addressed then also. Yes. <laughs> Well, you know, I think, I think there's the issue of making specific diagnoses and, and being respectful of the DSM, which I, I would, I would, <laughs> well, yeah, you know, but m at least when I work with my psychiatric residents, I say, you know, yes, we need to, we need to understand what illness we're dealing with, but there's so much more than that. We are not checklists of symptoms. And, you know, the, the checklist of I'm not sleeping well, I'm not eating well, I feel sad, it can be so many things. So we can't reduce that, you know, that reductionistic, you know, if you fit, you know, two in column B and, you know, three in column C, that means you have X diagnosis to me is not, uh, not attending to the care of a patient very well. But at the same time, uh, you know, I think understanding that we do have some categorical way of thinking about some of these things that might help lead to the best treatment that part does make sense. Now, with that said, I, I want to tell you that the, the, at least the draft currently of DSM-5 has no reference whatsoever to the psychological underpinnings of things like conversion disorder. So that's, to me, a scary topic. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure what they're going to say it's appropriate to this forum, but uh, I, I heard the talk which was given yesterday and uh, so it looks like you, uh, uh, you're trying to define the, this problem, which is kind of the, the roots of this is escaping, and they not follow the, the formal way, definition of the diseases which were classified. Uh, I wonder if you thought of the curses, uh, that the person can be, can be cursed. Mm -hmm. uh, and that can cause something which falls out of uh, the, the, the definition of, uh, of the disease. Mm -hmm. Just right. as a, you know. So I would submit to you that if we listen to the patient's story 
if we sat down with him and said, tell me about this. Tell me how you got here. What is this about? What does it mean to you? We would hear that. We would say, I, a voodoo curse was put on me, and that's why this is happening to me. And then we could begin to understand the patient rather than throwing drugs at them and, um, and psychoanalysis or whatever it is that's, yes. Right. I absolutely agree with that. I don't know if all of you heard what she said, that, that it's a relational illness and that the, the I mean, what I say to every, every resident that I supervise for psychotherapy is it is the relationship that heals. You can do CBT or you can do psychoanalysis or you can do interpersonal psych, doesn't matter. What heals the patient is the relationship. Right. It's very hard to follow up talks that we've heard this morning. Um, Siri, I'm still doing internal reflection now after your talk. Uh, I am a neurologist, and that's the last time I'm going to admit to that. But um, <laughs> you'll see that I talk about disparity between psychiatry and neurology, and this is a huge area where this is so evident. Um, Kurt uh, talks about um, us approaching this problem as neuropsychiatrist or neuropsychology perspective. And you have to realize that there still is a huge gap out in the medical world between neurologists and psychiatrists and how much they understand um, of this condition and how they can relate and how they can provide management. Um, when I go back 20 plus years when I started at Henry Ford after fellowship, it was very much, I was an epileptologist in the first two and a half years in the epilepsy monitoring unit, every case was an epilepsy surgery case. There were no diagnostic cases coming in. Not that they weren't there, it's just they were rated second on the ladder to be done at that time, which again raises the issue of how that was approached. And it's been a very learning experience for me over that 20 years as I've seen those patients and heard the histories and see how they've been managed by neurologist alone, how they've been managed by a combination of neurology and psychiatry, and what type of uh, barricades uh, we've run into with that relationship and how do we make that change. Uh, when I started at Ford's, there was really nothing there. By the time, before I left there, there was a full-time physician who, was board, who had done residency in psychiatry and neurology, who that was what he was doing, was psychogenic non-epileptic seizure clinics. And there was a full-time psychologist who also did that all week. Problem is, once I made the move, now I have none of that anymore, and I'm back to the same issue as how do we approach this. You mentioned also that being a static problem here with how we look at this disorder, that same static issue kind of falls in when we look at documentation and coding. Um, remember that a lot of these rules that we have to follow weren't even made by people in the medical world per se, and we've taken our issues back to them to see how we can make those changes, um, but it's been a slow process. And you'll hear a little bit about some of the challenges we have today, we've had yesterday, and what we face in the upcoming years when we talk about document documentation and coding for PNES. So just briefly, obviously the PNES is considered a psychiatric diagnosis and I'm not a psychiatrist and won't get into the breakdown of classification, somatoform conversion disorder or dissociative disorder with presenting neurologic symptoms. Typically the diagnosis is we bring a patient into the monitoring unit and capture some of their typical events. And with that, as was mentioned with Su by Susan, is you have to have a very good history. A lot of these patients, we may have a strong suggestion of that diagnosis even before they come in the monitoring unit if you get a very good history. You'd be amazed how neurologists don't do that. Um, I remember starting um, working with a couple neurohospitalists who were seeing patients in the monitoring unit, and when I got into the history from them, it was amazing the questions that were not asked. And we're talking pretty common questions, too. The ideal situation <clears throat> is to have a multidisciplinary team that addresses the disorder comprehensively, collaboratively, and in a timely fashion. This brings up one of the major issues a lot of people still face today in clinical medicine. I mean, ideally, we should have a psychiatrist as part of that team who on day one of admission to the monitoring unit in one form or fashion is involved with that case. 
and understands what, what the workup is in occurring, what discussions are occurring, and are part of the presentation of the diagnosis and the transition of that patient care. Unfortunately, still throughout the majority of centers around the country, you've got the neurologist who's doing his thing, doesn't see anything on the EEG, and as was said earlier, is non-epileptic, not my problem, see you later kind of thing. The other issue is where we do have a psychiatric consultation, unfortunately, uh, a lot of psychiatrists really are not very well suited for this problem either. Uh, many psychiatrists run for the hills when this diagnosis. Anything that has a seizure connected to it, not all psychiatrists like to be involved with. And one of the things I saw uh, in my previous, uh, at Henry Ford was, as we get a psychiatry consultation, it was kind of, okay, this is what I think, but then the transition of care went to someone we don't know because it's not covered by my insurance and you're going to find someone else in a terrible way to do the process. So there are gaps uh, across the board that we're still trying to address. Oops, hit the wrong button here. Let's take the classic scenario. We have accurate diagnosis of psychogenic non-epileptic seizures in a monitoring unit, a collaborative multi multidisciplinary evaluation, and treatment starting right in the epilepsy monitoring unit, from presentation of diagnosis to uh, a very organized and planned follow-up. That results in what? Best patient care, accurate documentation and coding, but that's where we get into a little bit of our problem, accurate documentation and coding. We don't code in the monitoring unit. We document, and if we've just had the discussion with the patient that the diagnosis based on the data in your history is psychogenic non-epileptic seizures, and we have the psychiatrist sitting next to us who's also providing that same input and further intervention, uh, where does that land us and what kind of problem does that create? Well, when it falls into the psychiatric bucket, it creates a major issue with how much you're reimbursed, versus if it's still considered an epileptic seizure disorder. These patients present with the same initial problem, recurrent seizures, but now all of a sudden they've fallen into two completely different buckets. And unfortunately, that does affect the caregivers. They get called by the administrator and saying, wait, you've had four patients in now, and we're not getting reimbursed like these other 12 that you had the last two weeks. So this issue of limited hospital reimbursement, the hospital and the clinicians may argue, well, it's lots of money to provide this service. I mean, the technicians, the hardware, the software, the, length of stay and so on, um, is there a way to justify that? One of the ways that people probably in their mind feel they can justify it is what potentially happens to the patient. Patients who, for example, have limited coverage or a carve-out policy through a Blue Cross Blue Shield, and all of a sudden they get done with their one week of evaluation in the monitoring unit and the diagnosis was made, and now they've got to pay for 50% of that, which is about nine to $10,000. So you can see where that potentially can create a problem. So if we look at some of the issues just of coding, a lot of times your admitting diagnosis is very much the same. Recurrent or repetitive seizures is 780.39. Problem is, anywhere on that chart, once that psychogenic term gets in, put in place, that's where it goes down a different pathway. And that's where reimbursement is an issue. Now we're not saying that's right. Obviously you're gonna hear about some of the changes where mental health should be reimbursed just like other medical problems and surgical problems. And this goes back to politicians and Medicare rules years before us that have taken years to try to fix. But unfortunately, right now, it still really falls in that bucket um, where you are getting less reimbursement. Now, using the term psychogenic and it falling into a psychiatric bucket, most would argue that's appropriate. That's where it belongs. It's a primary psychiatric diagnosis, but there's you have decreased reimbursement and what expenses or other issues your patients incur because that happens. If the term psychogenic has not been used and you just stick with the non-epileptic seizure uh, terminology, which you are correct, it's a non-epileptic seizure based on your data, but the bottom line is in the majority of cases you're pretty comfortable that you know that there should be the psychogenic non-epileptic seizure terminology being used. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion to not be very specific because of the issue that occurs with reimbursement. If you put the term non-epileptic isn't, isn't um, recognized in the index for ICD-9, so then it goes to seizures, and that's why you can stay with the 780.39 if that's what your documentation is. 
course, that falls in a different DRG and therefore a different reimbursement, which is significantly better than the psychiatric bucket. So why is this a problem? Well, this goes back to um, lack of parity in uh, mental health uh, conditions and reimbursement. There was the mental health parity law that was signed in September of 1996, and that was really an attempt to fix the problem where mental health disorders should be approached and reimbursed in a similar fashion to medical and surgical problems. It didn't occur though. As you know, if you've spent any time on Capitol Hill or with laws and other people who are involved with that, there's ways to get around that. And insurers were able to circumvent that law because then they had ways where they could uh, kind of cap the number of days of inpatient psychiatric admission, um, the number of visits you could have in a year, the size of the copay, um, and cost sharing issues. So you had patients who were provided the service, but they were gonna lose their house and their car and their right leg to try to pay for it. Luckily, we had two senators, Senators Wellstone and Domenici, who put together what's called the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act of 2008, which really makes a strong attempt to try to fix this problem. Uh, Senator Wellstone unfortunately died in a plane crash in 2002, uh, but that act went through with his name because of the efforts that these two senators put together to try to really provide mental health parity. You know there are state, states that have certain laws with mental health parity, but this is really from a national perspective, how do we try to change this? To give you a little bit of example of some of the changes that that will bring on, if we look at outpatient mental health um, uh, treatment and expenses and reimbursement, you can see that with that new act, these changes will phase in through 2014. Um, it's a slow process, but it makes a big difference. And in these days in healthcare, how many times do you actually see the amount you're getting reimbursed for something go up? So we're finally getting in the right direction here, but we still face the issue of what's been in place now, in previous years, and what we still have to deal with over the next three to four years as that fixes. So what have we done in the meantime? And when I say we, you can kind of take that personally. Are you involved in these cases? Are we talking neurologists? Are we talking psychiatrists? Who's involved in this? So one of the questions is because of what the patient may end up paying for or this lack of reimbursement, are patients not pursu pursuing evaluation because these are non-covered benefits? So are there patients out there that we really could help, but because of the way the system is, they're just not seeking care? And Unfortunately, that results in even more expense because there's the ER evaluation every third week and the treatment by 12 different doctors who are completely disconnected. Are the physicians limiting evaluations and admissions because of limited reimbursement? You know, when I started doing this kind of work, my concept in my mind was, okay, we've got a patient with recurrent seizures, we're gonna bring them into the monitoring unit and they're gonna stay until we answer the question. Really, the limiting factor was scalp EEG electrode abrasion of the skin, you know, and breakdown or infection. That was the limiting factor. Because part of that put the challenge also with the patient. Because you're, gonna, you're with them, you're there to answer the question. Now what's happened is you've got a lot of centers that are saying, we're gonna bring you in the monitoring unit, we're gonna answer that question, but you're only in for three days. And after three days, you have to go out. And the patient already has this idea, this is a time limited issue, and a lot of times those questions aren't gonna be answered. And unfortunately, then you have someone who's in for EMU three or four different times for three and four day periods without getting an answer. Intermixed with ER visits and again, multiple medications and multiple physicians. Are there ways around the problem until it gets completely fixed? How much can we justify doing because the law really was wrong to begin with, but we can't, should that suggest that we should misdocument on records? That we use nomenclature that isn't really appropriate for the care? And those are important questions. As I said, the length of admission historically was based on answering the clinical question. Now is it more on financial fe feasibility and coverage in even clinicians' minds because they get asked to answer that question. Coding for psychogenic non-epileptic seizures. For Medicare and Medicaid, it's fraudulent to use a code other than the appropriate code. That's something you have to remember. Uh, once you see that term psychogenic, uh, then a psychiatric code must be used. If the psychiatric diagnosis is, is known, then you should code very specifically to that diagnosis. 
If it's not known, the term psychogenic defaults to this 316, um, which is psychic factors associated with diseases classified elsewhere, and one of the most common of those is the conversion disorder. So what has been the justification of other coding? There's been lots of discussion with neurologists who are stuck in the middle to a certain extent of this, and again, they re recommended staying with the 780.39 as that is a primary diagnostic code for non-epileptic seizures. These are non-epileptic seizures. The question is, can we justify continuing to be so vague from day one of admission to date of discharge? And then, of course, you're using a secondary code, but secondary codes really don't make a big Im impact on what happens with uh, reimbursement and what patients pay for also. Conversion disorder can be an accurate diagnosis, but many people feel that that's overused um, presently. One of the arguments is the specific psychiatric diagnosis is not made till later, so keep it vague, and then you can call it something else, conversion disorder or whatever, once they're evaluated by psychiatrists on an outpatient basis. The, pro the argument there is really should a psychiatry input be waiting until an outpatient, uh, why aren't they involved in the care right at the time of the diagnosis? The seizure code obviously helps differentiate from epilepsy, but it still stays in that neurology bucket, and that's why neurologists like that. Um, there was also a suggestion at one time, which was, I thought, a bit odd, but when there were discussions with National Association of Epilepsy Center, American Academy of Neurology, and neurologists in general, there is this 345.81 code of other forms of epilepsy where th or recurrent seizures where you could arguably say, could you put it in that bucket? The problem is, if it's under that umbrella with epilepsy, you really, I don't think, should be looking down that road. And remember, coding is based on documentation. You have coders who are out in this other office and they're looking through the charts. So when they see certain terms, that's how they determine what the code is, either 780.39 or if you end up in a psychiatric code. We have some colleagues from Europe who have far more experience in ICD-10 than I do. Um, we don't have it here yet. But there will be changes from ICD-9 to ICD-10, and this is a bit of the breakdown. The hope is when this is all in place, it really won't be an issue as we try to correct what's happening on reimbursement and how medical, surgical, and psychiatric illnesses are viewed and reimbursed by, uh, in healthcare. These are some of the numbers just to show you that we'll be talking about as we go to ICD-10 and if they fall under psychogenic, and supposedly um, we have one that says conversion disorder and talks about also having the seizures associated with that. There's also the recurrent seizures where we're not really sure that still fall into kind of the neurology bucket, um, but we shouldn't be abusing it or using it maybe the way that is being used right now. And then of course if you have events which you thought were seizures but are some other organic process like syncope, there's another category uh, of course that that will fall in. So the questions to ask you, or for discussion, or thought process is, is it okay, is it appropriate, even question, is it ethical, to be vague with documentation to avoid coding, which results in less financial reimbursement, even when we all know that the way the law was written really is an error, that mental health disorders shouldn't be viewed as a two-third importance and two-third reimbursement. Is it okay to be vague in documentation to help avoid incurring excessive debt? Is it okay to be vague in documentation, be vague in documentation because you cannot be 100% sure of the diagnosis? Some neurologists argue, well, I'm not really completely sure, and we'll, we'll never have the 100%, but come on, let's be real. There's a pretty strong feeling that when you have a, a, a patient with psychogenic non-epileptic seizures, most of those cases are relatively straightforward from a video EEG standpoint. And is it okay to use nonspecific terminology to avoid psychiatric classification? Finally, is it okay not to consult psychiatry for a primary psychiatric di uh, disorder? You, once you consult psychiatry, you can bet you're going to have documentation on that chart that's going to change where you land in what bucket. Should, is it okay to make a definitive psychiatric diagnosis as a neurologist? I would argue, I mean, I'm boarded in psychiatry and neurology. Um, I know how much psychiatry I did. I did a lot of psychiatry work before I got into medical school. I view myself as an expert in this bucket, maybe on the epilepsy neurology side, because I maintain 
what's in the literature, I read the manuscripts, I'm, I feel like I'm up to date. Am I that way with, with psychiatry? Ain't gonna happen. And so I have a, even though I think a neurologist is very important in determining epileptic versus non-epileptic, the actual breakdown in classification, I still think we have limitations. And if we continue to say we are the experts to determine epileptic versus non-epileptic, then how do we justify being vague and not making a definitive diagnosis at least along the ladder of epileptic versus non-epileptic in the monitoring unit? Finally, is it okay to, for us to justify limiting the length of evaluation of a patient in a monitoring unit based on their insurance coverage? You have five patients with this history, the exact history over here, but these are Medicare patients. These are commercial payers. You look at your reimbursement. Whoa, I'm going to start losing my shirt after day four or five with this patient, so we need to do a limited stay. That's happening around the country. Is that appropriate? And on that, I will open it up to discussion. Thanks for your attention. So I have two options. One, explain to the patient it's not my specialty. To the best of my knowledge, go for the 60 minutes they actually were looking for and try to practice out of my scope to practice with all the consent. This is all I can do. This is the best I can do. And let's see if it works. But I ideally want to see a psychiatrist. And they say, I'm not going to go 30 miles down the road. And this is too far. I'm too afraid. Can you help me? Can you treat me? And I don't know if that is the best or not the best. Right now, I have a collection of patients that do not want to be with So what's the best approach? You can say, not a black thing. I've done my neurological training. This is it. See a psychiatrist or get out of your scope of practice. Remember, you were a neurologist, a physician before you were an expert. Yeah, unfortunately that's the situation that I think we have all around the world. Um, and what you did, I think, the first thing is you were honest with the patient. You told them that this is not your specialty area and they need to realize that what you're providing still may have some limitations, but you're doing the best you can. Um, I think there's a lot of us who are faced in that situation. When I moved to Grand Rapids, I'm in a similar situation that I, that I was in that for a number of years. And, as long as I'm truthful with the patient, do as much reading and interaction with psychiatrists and try to, to bridge that gap, that's really the best we can do right now. I mean, I talk about the ideal situation and a psychiatrist being part of the team on day one in the epilepsy monitoring unit. I think that's what we really have to push for, but it's not realistic in a lot of places right now. And, you know, you're doing the best you can. When we, we talk about somewhere out here in Montana that doesn't have this pediatric subspecialist, well, the pediatrician has to step up and do the best they can. So you have a great point, uh, and I think you're doing the right things. Uh, you're going to continue to try to improve that process, but you can't create psychiatrists who have that interest who are living next door to you. To uh, transition between Dr. Stagno and Dr. Klein, this is a brief video of an interaction with a patient's family member to um, illustrate the importance of language that we use in caring for our patients. What's your daughter's diagnosis? Non-epileptic seizure. All right. And when she uh, first had her events, give me a brief story of what happened. Well, we were in the hospital following a car accident where she bumped her head. Uh, she looked fine. We, just as she was ready to leave, she started having a seizure, what I perceived as a seizure. It was a full body seizure, and um, my reaction was to go and comfort her, make sure she didn't hit her arms or legs on the bars of the, the gurney, and I was told to step away from her because she was having a pseudo-seizure. I had never heard that term before, and then when I learned what exactly it was, I felt kind of hurt. It, it bothered me because I thought to myself, why would a person want to have a seizure? Why would they have a fake seizure? You know, and um, I, I never liked that term after that. When, when, I, when she had gotten a seizure following that, they used the term non-epileptic seizure. Uh, it, it made me have a better understanding of exactly what was going on. What was your treatment by the uh, treatment providers? They were very cold to me. I don't know why, but they, they kept telling me and they got very angry because my family members came in and they did the same thing I did. They went over to calm her and hold her arms from hitting the sides of the gurney. 
because she had been really thrashing a lot. I mean, a lot. I mean, it involved her whole legs, arms, everything. And they just kept saying, get away from her, just leave her be, let her hit, you know, wherever. They said, she's, that's just, it's not a real seizure, it's a pseudo seizure. And I was very frustrated, and I ended up taking her home that evening because I didn't feel like she was getting the care that she needed. Uh, my, my goal here is to just try to orient uh, us to what uh, I'm going to call PNN, PNES. Um, uh, caregiving ethics. Um, uh, my intention is not to, to go through and, and list all the ethical issues that, that arise in this area or even um, identify the most important ones. Really my, my goal here, because I, I think a lot of that will come out of our discussion, um, I will at the end sort of group some of, uh, try to provide some grouping of, of concerns that I, I think may be helpful. Um, but really, what I want to do is try to get us up to, to speed on, on some of the ethical frameworks that, that inform discussions uh, around caregiving and some of which I think, uh, some of the language of which I think filters into uh, some of the discussions around um, uh, PNES uh, caregiving ethics. So, um, so my hope is that this talk will be a, a fruitful point of departure for, um, for the discussion that follows. So, uh, so what is caregiving? Um, in very generic terms, uh, one could define it as the act of providing uh, physical, psychological, or other forms of assistance to someone in persistent uh, or recurring need. Uh, this seems relatively uncontroversial in, in the area where I do most of my work, which is in dementia. You sort of know who the caregiver is. You kind of know what they do. Uh, there isn't a whole lot of um, uncertainty as to what activities constitute caregiving. Uh, you know, I think when it comes to uh, non-epileptic seizures, I think it's, uh, caregiving is a bit more of a, a loaded term. You know, I think uh, there's, there's sometimes a, a sense that caregivers are being helpful, sometimes that they're, they're not being helpful. Um, it's sometimes unclear um, whether or not that's an appropriate term. Um, but I think that, you know, if, you, if we gather up the, the number of people who, who are affected, the patients who are affected by this condition, and then assume that at least one family member or at least one concerned person is, um, is providing some level of care to these, uh, these individuals, you really get a sense that there are a great number of people who are, um, I think it's reasonable to say, providing caregiving or, and are caregivers of one kind or another. So, you know, we can characterize caregiving uh, according to certain sort of ideals. So ideals such as uh, selflessness, empathy, uh, patience, um, interwoven identity. By that I mean that uh, a number of caregivers, or many caregivers sort of view their, um, who they are as, as persons as tied up with providing caregiving. Um, and I, you know, I think that if we, if we think about, uh, I, I think, Caregivers are often outside of the, the viewpoint of medicine. Um, you know, the caregivers are the people who bring in the, bring in the patient, who uh, provide some uh, uh, history. But if you really think about caregivers in this situation, it's who is the person who uh, confronts EMS uh, when they arrive at the, at the house or at Walmart? I mean, who's, who's the person that's the, that's the first one to talk to them about that? Who's giving the consent for treatment in the ER or intubation in the ICU. After all, after all you know, something like 40% of uh, these patients will get an ICU stay at some point in their life. Um, who's, who's, having the, who's sitting beside the patient on the ride home from the, the EMU uh, uh, monitoring and, uh, and discussing um, you know, terms such as uh, seizure or it's in your head or uh, no medical explanation? Right? I mean, these are, these are discussions that we're not privy to, but have a, have a great effect on, on what the patient takes away from their interactions with the medical system and, and what ultimately happens with them. And, you know, it's the caregiver who um, has to call in sick to, to take care of the, the, the patient after a spell or get passed over for promotion or change or lose jobs or uh, defer on giving attention to other family members um, or 
uh, defer on their own interests and in projects uh, because they're repeatedly and unexpectedly having to deal with, with these uh, spells. So we can see how the, the ideals of, um, of caregiving um, uh, are at play in, in all of the, the things that caregivers do. So, so mostly what I want to do today is focus on the obligations that the healthcare system or providers have to caregivers, but I think it's, it's hard to do that without first getting a little bit of a handle on, um, on the, the role of caregiving and what obligations there might be uh, for caregivers to the person they're caring for. And people become caregivers for all kinds of reasons. Um, some want to do it, some are forced to do it, some are good at it, some are probably less good at it. Um, but regardless, being in this role, like being a, f a firefighter or being a teacher, uh, brings with it certain role-based obligations. Um, and you know, I think when we think about caregivers in epilepsy generally, uh, we have a, a fairly good sense of, of what that caregiving entails, what those obligations are. So you know, the, the caregiver in epilepsy um, tries to keep the, their, uh, their, usually their loved one uh, safe, right? So they keep them out, keep them, remind them to stay off of ladders or out of bathtubs. They uh, try to encourage them to, to take medications as directed. Um, monitor risk factors like um, substance use or, um, or getting a good amount of sleep. But I think when it comes to caregiving in uh, PNES, I think uh, what obligations there are, I think, are less clear. And I think part of what uh, this discussion um, would be helpful for is helping to, to, to sort of round out what that, uh, what that role entails. So, so I think of greater interest to us here is uh, what obligations the, the healthcare system ought to have to, um, to caregivers. In short, what are our obligations to them? So, so I think that I've listed three what I'm calling models here uh, in which um, we can think about the, these sorts of obligations. The, the first is what I would call sort of a, a derivative obligations model, which is that uh, caregivers are, are instrumental to the diagnosis and treatment of, of uh, the patient. And so the primary orientation here is the, the doctor-patient relationship, that, that um, traditional relationship that, out of which uh, there's a, a uh, general understanding of what obligations fall to, to, the, to the healthcare system and clinicians uh, more specifically. And the, the, uh, uh, care, uh, the caregiver in that instance is sort of outside that relationship and is there to, to help facilitate it in, in whatever way he or she can. Uh, so, for instance, um, you know, if we if we think about caregiver burden, uh, and if that's a if that's a concern for the healthcare system, on this sort of model, that's important um, only insofar as it um, affects the patient. So, a burned out caregiver is going to provide let presumably less good caregiving, and so uh, in that way, whatever obligations there are to the to the caregiver are derivative of obligations to the patient. So the advantage of this sort of model is that it, uh, it doesn't upset the sort of traditional doctor-patient relationship model uh, and the obligations that flow from it. The, the downside is it's sort of a rather thin model of uh, moral obligation. And, and I think it, it uh, can tend to um, run counter to um, Kant's dictum of, of using individuals merely as means to some other end, in this case, the, the um, well-being of the patient. Um, the second model is the, the caregiver as patient. So, you know, the caregiver come, comes into the clinic or the hospital. They have, um, um, they interact with the healthcare system. They express their own biopsychosocial needs. Um, you know, they, there's a lot of literature out there on caregiving. Um, particularly in other areas, and the, and the burdens associated with it. There are um, health consequences of um, uh, depression and other mood disturbances, um, weight loss or weight gain, uh, demoralization, somatization. Um, so, so caregivers certainly experience um, a lot of harms to their own well-being and their own health. So 
adopting this sort of model to, 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 for figuring out what obligations we have as a healthcare system to caregivers is, is good because it's familiar, particularly to clinicians. We sort of understand these sorts of uh, the obligations that come out of this. And it's certainly true that caregivers, given, um, given those things that I just mentioned, could, could use an advocate. Um, uh, and so I think that's one of the, the benefits of taking that sort of model. The disadvantage is they're not actually patients, and, uh, and so we can't uh, in most cases. And so, and so there, the, the fiduciary obligations, the legal obligations uh, don't really uh, fit here. And I, I don't think in this model we have a clear sense of what it means to be kind of a quasi-patient um, or how to, to, to weigh the the different obligations and interests that might come out of um, the, the patient, the clinician's obligations to the patient, and the clinician's obligations to the caregiver as patient. Um, and then the, the, third, uh, the third model I wanted to mention here was sort of the, the family unit model. So there's been a lot of interest in bioethics in the last two decades or so on the role that, um, well, on the, on the sort of patient autonomy-centered uh, paradigm that has infused uh, bioethics and, uh, and instead trying to, to push toward uh, a view of a uh, patient as, as not just coincidentally part of a family but, but centrally part of uh, a family and, and all of the uh, roles and responsibilities that go with that. Um, and so the, the idea here is that you can't really uh, talk about um, the obligations to the caregiver um, in isolation or to the patient in isolation, but you have to sort of talk about obligations uh, at, to the family as some sort of organic um, whole. Um, the advantage here is that it takes the idea of family seriously and that uh, decisions in the healthcare arena do sort of come out of uh, families in many instances. The disadvantage here is that we're very accustomed to the patient autonomy model and very comfortable with it in a, in a lot of ways and have become so over the last three, four decades. And I think we're a little less, less clear on what it really means in concrete instances uh, to, to have decisions come out of uh, a family um, and not be assigned to particular individuals. Uh, and the other disadvantage, I think, which isn't always uh, recognized and is particularly the case in caregiving, is that, uh, that treating, um, treating, treating uh, you, adopting this model and sort of treating families as, as wholes can, can uh, reinforce certain uh, inequalities and certain unjust power relationships within families. So the patient, the caregiver, who is uh, the person in the family who's sort of forced into the caregiving role and, um, and must sacrifice everything while everyone else sort of uh, washes their hands uh, of, the, of the burden of that. So my point in, in sort of mentioning these is not to advocate for one or the other, but just to sort of lay them out uh, so that we can see how they inform uh, a lot of the considerations in this area. So, so let's get to... Um, a little bit more of the discussion. So I put this uh, slide in here to remind me that although we don't talk about it a lot, uh, patients too have obligations. And I think um, patients uh, are in a vulnerable position. Um, and, uh, and so we tend not to require much of them uh, because of that. But, uh, but I think it's, um, but patients too have obligations to their family and and some might even say to the healthcare providers or the healthcare system. Um, and this isn't, this isn't a way of, of being hard on patients, but it's actually a way of sort of um, showing uh, a, a deeper sense of respect for um, them as uh, their autonomy and also them as participates, participants in, in the moral community. Um, and so I think, I think that is something we need to, to sort of keep in mind that, that everyone here has um, some, uh, some obligations. So, so what are the, the key domains? So what I want to suggest is that um, is sort of a grouping here, that the, the first domain is, is for us to, to get a sense of how we want to def how, how the caregiver uh, role is, is properly defined and what obligations um, go with that. The second is trying to clarify this uh, uh, 
clinician caregiver relationship. And the third is, is trying to think about patient responsibilities if there are any. Um, try to get our hand, uh, head around that. All right. So the first is um, uh, d defining the caregiver role. So, um, so how should uh, caregivers participate in the diagnostic process? I mean, should they just be mere sources of information or should they be um, interpreters of, of um, their loved ones uh, of history? Should they be uh, passive recipients of the diagnosis, um, you know, sit, sit in a chair while the, the diagnosis is, is given, or should they uh, be involved in communicating that diagnosis in some way? Um, uh, and when it comes to, to therapeutic involvement, so what should, what should caregivers, how involved should they be in the therapy? Should they, um, should they be intimately involved in the therapeutic plan or should they just sort of stay, stay out of the way? Should they be monitoring uh, in the home and, and providing information back to the clinician, maybe outside of, uh, of earshot of the patient or is, or is that not appropriate? And, you know, when it comes to personal boundaries of the caregiver, so um, how far should the caregiver have to go try to, to improve the well-being of, of the person they're caring for? Should they have to change their relationship with that, with that person? So um, be less critical uh, of, of, the, of their loved one or practice tough love or, or something else? Should they have to get um, treatment themselves? So should they have to get treated for depression or anxiety or, or other things? Um, are they obligated to, to sacrifice everything, or are there limits to what we expect of caregivers? So filling in the contours of this role, I think, is uh, going to be an important, but also a challenge. So again, again, I think we need to focus on what the boundaries are of, of the caregiver-clinician relationship. Um, is, the, is the healthcare system at all responsible for the, the well-being or the interests of the caregiver. And when we say interest, do we just mean medical interests? So um, do we just mean their, um, their depression and anxiety or their fatigue? Or do we mean that uh, the healthcare system ought to be considering their interest more broadly, so sort of life satisfaction? Should the clinician be um, writing work absence notes for caregivers? Um, sort of what it, where is that line um, for um, for the caregiver-clinician relationship. Um, how can we adjudicate the conflicts between, um, between caregiver interests and patient interests? Um, and, you know, I think when, when we talk about caregiver burden, that's, that's uh, where this comes to the fore. And, uh, and then what is an appropriate use of, of caregivers? So, uh, so how involved should they be? Um, what if, uh, what if the, the um, should, should clinicians help caregivers uh, uh, manipulate patients if, if that's somehow going to be of ultimate benefit to the patient? Should they uh, not, part not participate in that but, but, uh, but turn a blind eye to that? So, um, so I think there's some um, sticky issues here. And finally, what are uh, patient responsibilities, if any? So what, how, how does this diagnosis place constraints on our understanding of, of patient autonomy? And what can we reasonably expect of, of patients in this uh, situation? Uh, and are there, are there obligations of, of patients to their family members, the, the people who are making sacrifices, uh, often uh, significant sacrifices on their behalf? Um, and do these, uh, do these obligations, if there are any, change over the course of, of the disease from when they're uh, searching for a diagnosis to um, starting therapy to, um, to trying to stick to therapy? And finally, are there, does it even make sense to talk about um, correlative obligations to, to uh, health care providers or not? Is there an obligation to give um, truthful and helpful information in the diagnostic process? Is there any kind of obligation to um, adopt a therapeutic plan or to, um, or to stick to a ther therapeutic plan? So I know this, 
has just sort of scratched the surface of, um, of the ethical issues here, um, but I'm hopeful that it, it'll stimulate some uh, conversation. See patients with all kinds of diseases and that are well and able to interact in the world who are caregivers themselves. And so your, uh, your, your talk nicely highlighted the people that are caring for the, the person with non-epileptic seizures, but many times at the same time they're also So let me just say a few words about that, and then I'll, I'll pass it on to, to people who have some more expertise in this area. Um, you know, I think it is I think it is complicated, and I think that uh, we, uh, you know, one of the one of the early slides, I mentioned this sort of interwoven identity, which which I think highlights the notion that uh, that caregivers really their their interests are very much bound up with successful um, treatment. Uh, of, of the pe person they're caring with. Um, uh, but not all, not all interests are always going to align. And so, uh, and so I think there's, you we're probably talking about uh, individual case, ca individual cases have to be dealt with sort of on an individual basis, I think. Um, but I would be interested to, to sort of hear how, um, how, the, how the clinicians who deal with this uh, more frequently sort of, sort of deal with um, involving caregivers in, in the therapeutic endeavor? So it's, it's an excellent question, and as I alluded to in the introduction, the patient with non-epileptic seizures is an individual who exists in the context of a system, and whether that's fam family, friends, uh, again, community of faith, social supports. Uh, so while the, the patient gets identified because she's got the seizures, she's the problem, uh, when you start to look at the dynamic and the interaction of the family and you say, well, it sounds like that you're having trouble with your, uh, you know, your family member here and the son arguments that you're having frequently. So bringing in the family is an important uh, component of treating patients in the context of their family. The other thing that we do is at the beginning of the treatment that we developed for non-epileptic seizures, we said, well, how, do, how do these seizures, what are the things that you can identify as reasons that you want to take control of these seizures and you want to get rid of these seizures? And they'll ask, well, I want to drive again, I want to get back to work, I want to be able to go out. And then we'll also ask, what are reasons that you might not want to get rid of these seizures? And when we ask that question, then they have to do a little more reflection. They say, well, you know what, I mean, my, I'm, people are taking care of me. And that's not the case for everybody, but there is some inherent, there's an element of being cared for that could be part of that illness. Uh, so we have to address both the pros and the cons, and then they can work through, is that, is this, what's the risk benefit in that, in wanting to be cared for? 